So Michelle, you were 11 when the Nazis overran Poland, when England and France declared war on Germany. Can you tell us a little bit about your life in Brussels just before then? Because I think I'm, I'm struck by how ordinary an experience you had in many ways. Well, I grew up like any other kid. I went to school. Got together where you would play hooky once in a while. Learning, which was not particularly great. I mean, I was not a great student. But uh, I enjoyed living there. Thank you, Nick. My parents didn't have much time for us because my parents were learning a new language in a new country, making a new living, and my father managed to be able to get into the newspaper, so we didn't have much parenting, so I was free to roam. I hardly ever saw my brother, I hardly ever saw my sister. My brother was three years older, my sister was four years older. So, freedom of the streets. Freedom of the streets. <laughs> we had kids. We, we didn't have a PTA back then. Uh, I don't remember my parents ever meeting any of my teachers. But school was all right. So during those years when the Nazis came to power and they began enacting their plan for the Jews, your father began noticing some signs, and not only noticing them, but, but writing about them in part because of what he had experienced himself. Can you tell us a little bit about how he was connecting some dots that maybe other people weren't seeing? Well, he had lived through the Russian Revolution and he was interned in Siberia, so he knew what, what that kind of life would be. He managed to escape and make his way. When Hitler came to power, he took note of it and alerted his uh, his uh, colleagues through his writing. And in uh, 1933, he said, Hitler is coming to power. He read the Mein Kampf, and he knew what the program was going to be. So when uh, Poland was invaded, he was stranded in, in, port, in uh, Switzerland covering the convention, and he it took him a few months to get back, but then when Belgium was, uh, when Brussels was bombed and war started there, we immediately made plans to leave. And you described to me seeing some changes in your, in your parents, in, in sort of their behavior that was apparent to you. Well, they were quite anxious because I had lived through the, uh, through the Russian uh, dictatorship, partly, and they escaped that. And my father sort of expected what was coming. So we immediately left as soon as we could. We packed whatever we could take with us, left everything behind, and just moved. And tell us about your experience escaping from Brussels. Well, we packed everything we could. We walked to the railroad station. We, it took us a few hours to get into it because it was so crowded. We wanted to take the next train, which we missed because it was too crowded. Uh, we wanted to go to the coast to get to uh, take a ship to England. That ship was sunk. I'm glad we missed it. I wouldn't be here. The next train went to Mons, a city half hour away, and that city had been bombed completely out of existence practically, and we were delayed there because two nuns were arrested, and those nuns happened to be German parachutists. Disguised as nuns. And disguised as nuns. And the train kept going for the next seven days and seven nights through to southern France. We were bombed a few times. We were machine gunned a few times. The train stopped a couple of times. Some people got off, some people did not make it back. But we got back and my father pushed us under the seats for better protection. And Michel described for me, he was, uh, were you 11 or 12 at this point and 
seeing people who had gotten off the train lying in the fields because they had been hit by machine gun fire. Right. We finally made it to southern France. We were fed through the windows of the, uh, of the railroad cars. The French people give us food. And back then, well, French baguette was still good. <laughs> uh, in southern France, we were provided, that we were helped through the uh, local community. And then in, about five weeks later, France gave up. I signed an armistice to the capital move from Paris to Vichy, which is more in central France. My father's papers allowed him to travel still. My mother's uh, Persian passport had expired. And he tried to go to Vichy to get to renew the papers. But all the diplomats are gone and left France, and I went to Portugal mainly. And uh, my father tried to get the papers, so he followed them to, to Portugal to see if he could continue getting the papers. And that was the last time we saw him for a long time. We were stranded in France from the small town in Caser. We went to a farm, friends of my parents from Ukraine. And we stayed there for a few, a few months. And I learned farming. Nothing like uh, taking care of cattle, cows, lovely cows, riding horses, chopping wood, uh, whatever we can do there. So well, that was a learning experience, which I enjoyed. And then at, at some point, your family decides that it's best for you to move uh, to Marseille. Well, my mother thought that I had some diplomats left, maybe a Persian legation in Marseille. And so we uh, went to Marseille. And I think that's when we stopped first in Toulouse reception camp mm -hmm. for refugees. We were welcomed. They fed us. They provided us with bunks. But in the middle of the night, my mother decided she didn't feel right about it, and uh, she decided to get out. So we, it was a huge tent, one of those uh, army-type tents. In the middle of the night, we lifted the tarp and sneaked out. And later on, through this museum, I found out that these refugees were arrested and shipped to Auschwitz. So this is at least the second time that Michelle's family has uh, avoided a, a horrible fate, the sh sinking Third ship? Third time, yeah. Well, the first time was the bombing in Brussels. Bombing in Brussels, sinking of a ship, and then the reception center. Right. We got to Marseille, and we found the very nice accommodations in the slums right next to the railroad. Those slums were not welcoming the constabulary so that we hardly ever saw any cops over there because they were too scared to get down there. But it was a nice place for us. We were, and we had nice neighbors. We had uh, about as diverse a group as we could get. We had Italians, Corsicans, uh, Arabs, lots of Arabs. I had uh, opium smoking Chinese across the hall, across the square from us. And we were all friendly. It was a nice place to hide. And you make a great friendship and get in a lot of trouble? Well, I used to be able to, Marseille being on the Côte d'Azur practically, it was a beautiful weather. I managed to go to the beach practically every day in the summer. And I made uh, good friends, particularly one. His name was Raphael, who <laughs> called himself Café au lait. Anybody knows what that means? Café au lait means coffee with milk. His father was from the Cameroon, which had been a German colony until World War I. And his mother was from Denmark, so he was, well, he called himself Café au lait. <laughs> and we became very close friends. I used to go to his house practically every day. He never knew anything about me. He never came to our house. And I certainly would not invite him 
to that place we lived in, but he lived right by the, by the port. And uh, he taught me how to swim, how to skate, how to steal, how to whatever. Well, stealing became a necessity because food was getting scarce. And I remember sundown, I'd be able to, we'd be able to get undressed and jump right into the port, into the water. And we did a lot of things together. The one thing I remember well is uh, spearfishing, that was fun, and a little kayak that became a very important part of our activities, which I don't talk about. I believe you also told me that you don't think Cafe Olay had any inkling that, that you were Jewish, and that... We never talked about it. And, and tell everyone about what you, who you think his father worked for. Well, because Cameroon had been a German colony, we suspected that he was working with the Germans. And being black, well, it's not necessarily a good thing in France at that time. Any minority would not be great. But because he was black, we thought that he was able to, to do well. And it was a nice place, a nice house that he had. I remember that he used, they used to play records, uh, which I just, that's how I got acquainted mainly with opera, because there was one record that I particularly liked and that made me appreciate that kind of music. And he also, well, they were more intellectual. They spoke English at home. And, uh, well, he was French, of course. And he had his two sisters. One was in a wheelchair, and the other one was running around and never said hello. But that's what teenagers do. And so you, you mentioned the scarcity of food, which led your mom to a, a line of work. Well, food became scarce, and food became rationed. But because our documents had expired, we could not get these rations. So my mother went to business, calling, we call it black market. That was uh, remunerative in a way because she was able to buy things and sell it at a good price, particularly things like cigarettes and chocolates, sweets. There was in good demand and profits was very good. And what was the penalty had she been caught selling on the black market? Well, I have a picture of a, of a where it says black market is, uh, penalty is uh, hanging. But she took the risk. Yeah. There's a, a sound that you describe hearing in Marseille that signaled a really important arrival. The sound on the streets. Well, that was when uh, the Allied invaded North Africa in November 1942. The uh, American, the German troops just came down in mass. France had been divided into originally into an occupied zone and an unoccupied zone, and the unoccupied didn't have any German troops, although that did have a lot of Germans. That I found out about. But when the uh, Allied invaded North Africa, all the German troops came down, stomping down the main drag where my picture was taken with an horrific sound of the boots. It still resounds in my ears. Very frightening. That's when we decided, my mother said, let's get out of here. She had, uh, she knew the Jewish community there Many of them were doing black marketing, too. But there was a famous rabbi who also was, uh, had escaped there who advised my mother about what to do. And we decided to uh, escape to Spain. And shortly after you left, um, you talk about what happened to that, to that neighborhood. I found out through this museum again. When we left, 
On my birthday in the first year and when the war started, all the Jews in Brussels were being picked up and shipped to Auschwitz. About two months or so after we left Marseille, that neighborhood where my friend was, was also ethnically cleaned and the whole neighborhood was blown up because the Germans didn't want to be able to cope with that neighborhood. There are too many things going on. I remember once being caught in, caught in the net. One of the things that the Germans, well, the French actually did, and the French, of course, worked with the Germans, they would seal both, both ends of the street, pick up everybody in there, and if you didn't have papers, good luck. And I remember escaping from one of those by uh, sneaking from house to house that I was able to do with my friend. So, I never found out from my brother how he managed because I hardly ever saw him. <laughs> on your way to Spain, you have, an ex uh, I think, a significant experience on the train. We took the train from Marseille back to Toulouse to be able to transfer to the coast, to the mountains. And uh, lo and behold, on the train, we had German troops, rifles and everything. My mother could not speak French. She spoke Yiddish and Russian. And in order to be able to avoid suspicion, she started making signs like as if she were deaf. We kids, of course, spoke French like the natives, but we caught on and we responded in kind. And we never had any problems. We, get, we got to the border without any problems, but that was a pretty scary moment. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how your mother's work enabled you to, to escape at that point? Well, with the money that she was able to, to earn, is that the right word? <laughs> we, she was able to buy forged papers to be able to travel and be able to get to the border safely because uh, any place back then to travel that had inspectors, police checking train and travelers but we were able to go to the mountains to an inn to relax because my sister had, uh, as an infant, she had the quiet polio and she, the doctor said she needed fresh air to be able to do better. That's how we were able to justify going to the mountains. So we got that. And once we were in the inn in, by the, at the border, we were approached by two cops, French policemen, national policemen, offered to take us across into Spain. We persisted at first, but then we didn't have any choice and we accepted. They were willing to take us into Spain for a small price of $10,000 each. So $40,000 later, that took us over. And I'll, again, through the museum, I found out that many of those guides, passers, were willing to accept the money and then turn over their clients to the local police. That happened, I understand quite a bit. We didn't know about it. I don't know what we would have done otherwise, but we had no choice. And you also told me, I, I believe, that that $40,000 would have been equivalent to about $500,000 today. Is that no, right? Clo closer to a million. Wow. Well, that's it's only money. But I think it's stunning that your mother had the forethought to save all that money because your living existence was pretty difficult while she was saving it all. Well, my mother my mother's the one who saved us. I mean, through the decisions of going to the farm, of going to Marseille, going... My father was in Portugal trying to get papers. Mm -hmm. 
this might be a good moment to talk about um, some letters that your family, that you recently discovered. Well, that was much later, yes. We can go back to it at the appropriate yeah. time then. Yeah, absolutely. So this is um, in December 1942 when your family is escaping through the mountains. Can you tell us what that experience was like? Well, we packed a few things, particularly because it was winter, November 42, and the Pyrenees Mountains rise up to about 7,000 feet. We didn't climb up. We went through it. We found it easier. Well, the cops found it. We were able to get through. We heard dogs, but we never encountered any, any guards. Those cops did a good job. So whatever they earned, I'm not going to quibble. I'm here. We got into Spain, and the cops disappeared. We took a nap for several hours in the inn, and then we were advised to take Spanish guides to take us into a Spanish city. But instead of going through woods, I followed the railroad tracks. It says it's easier to get into town if you follow the road. Within a couple of hours, we were spotted by the Spanish police, arrested. Everybody was sent to jail except me because I was too young. I was sent to an orphanage. So, and from jail, my brother was shipped to a concentration camp in Spain, Campo de Miranda, where they had their own, that just got over the civil war in Spain. Civil War from 1936 to 1939. And Franco was helped with his uh, Civil War by the Germans and the Italians. The Germans provided weapons. Hitler was, the, they were friends. And Franco was thinking of even of uh, joining Hitler in his war. But uh, I think because the Allies were getting too close, especially when they invaded North Africa, that Franco changed his mind and decided to work with him. So, uh, where was I? So your brother is, is sent to this concentration camp. He was sent to that concentration camp where they had mostly refugees. And we were uh, sent to uh, a small town where they had several hotels reserved just for refugees. And we were taken care of there. That was a decent place. And an American agency steps in next? Is it was right? an American agency, the Joint Distribution Committee, which I think was founded in 1911, World War I. And that subsidized us, that helped us. To go from the hotel, we were sent to live in town with a family in Barcelona, which is the, the largest city in Spain. It's a province of Catalonia, which is, had been called a reluctant bride of Spain because they resisted Franco more than anybody else. And we lived there for a while. Uh, I, lived there, I lived there for about six months. After six months, I was able to learn enough Spanish to be able to read Don Quixote de la Mancha, which is... I still enjoy occasionally. I read it in French originally, then in Spanish, and I came here and read it in English. Seems like three different stories in a way. <laughs> it's like reading Victor Hugo, The Miserable, in French, which I just loved. And then I read it in English. But uh, I did a lot of reading while I was in Marseille. I, I was able to get to a bookstore and do a lot of reading. And so what decision does your mother make without consulting you? Uh, the American organization offered to help children under 16 to save them out of Europe. And my mother signed me, she signed me up. She didn't ask me, she just signed me up. And in, in May 1943, she said goodbye. I said goodbye to the family, sister, brother, mother. Took the train to Madrid, picked up another load of kids, about 20 or so kids, 
We went to Lisbon to, for the ship, where I saw my father after three years, and he greeted me. We had been corresponding, and he greeted me. He said, you're now a man, so he offered me a cigarette. I didn't tell him that I'd start smoking before, but uh, at any rate. <laughs> and we said goodbye, I stayed with him for a few days, and I took the ship, then leaving the family behind. We should also tell everyone that the American agency helped get your brother out, so he was safe. Mm -hmm. Right, that your, your brother was no longer in the concentration camp, he was well, helped that, to get out. Well, yeah, everybody, we, we're, so we're all living in Barcelona together. Okay. We were living with the Spanish family. Soon after that, uh, my sister signed up to go to Palestine because in Marseille she had fallen in love with a Palestinian who was studying in France. And he, had to be able, he was able to escape to Spain also. And when he wanted to go back home, she said she'll go too. But by that time she also was a Zionist and my brother was advised to go with her as a chaperone. I'm glad I wasn't there, but then I went to Palestine. My mother hired another guy to take her to Portugal, and she rejoined my father. And I came here, and I landed. Well, we stopped and uh, picked up a load of cork and wine in Porto, in Portugal. Then we went to made a stop in the Azores, a Portuguese island in the Atlantic. And I remember that stop because uh, I remember the little boats around the ship with uh, people selling their wares or whatever. And I was able to buy two pineapple. I was still hungry by those days to some extent. I was very thin then too. I'd lost a lot. Well, some, that's another story. but. I bought two pineapples, which several days later I truly enjoyed because that had fermented to some extent. <laughs> but then I also remembered in the farm drinking milk directly from the cow, which was very enjoyable. Didn't have to heat it, just drink it. So your, your ship comes into Philadelphia, is that right? Ship finally comes into Philadelphia. And I saw the netting in the skies, and I thought they were greeting refugees, but these were just uh, airplanes or whatever, because the war was on already. That was uh, June, June 22, 1943. And uh, we were immediately put on a train to New York to a place called the Bronx. Never heard of it before. We stayed there for a few days. My, I had a cousin. My father had an uncle in Brooklyn. And the daughter came to visit me in the Bronx. Showed me America by taking me to a place called Radio City Musical. <laughs> that was all right. <laughs> and a few days later, she took me to live with them in Brooklyn. So I went to Brooklyn. And I lived with him for a few months. That September, just, uh, I didn't know a word of English except what I saw in the movies, you know. The movies in, in Europe are usually dubbed, but occasionally we get new ones. And I remember things like, I love you. <laughs> All right, okay. That's about the extent, but uh, I came to Brooklyn and didn't know anything. But that September, that took me to school. I had a vacation for three years. So I started high school, and the advisor who took me in was a French teacher, so I was able to be helped with them. And he was soon drafted after that. So I took English, and I took civics, and I took math. Uh, I think I flunked everything. But by the second year, Second year, I was reading Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, my junior year, I took physics. I didn't like a bit. <laughs> my senior year, I took chemistry, and I just loved. The teacher was just fabulous. He really made it 
which were fascinating, I decided to go from journalism to chemistry. And my parents came in 46, May 46, and uh, I graduated just a few months later, and I decided to go to college as a major in chemistry. I made high school in three and a half years with honors. And uh, I joined clubs. I, my, I had a friend in, my, in Spain who we made a chess set, and I became pretty good at chess competing in the club there, and the French club in high school, and math club and chemistry club. I was living it up. <laughs> then I applied to college, and I, I was accepted in every school I had, ex, uh, ex, uh, had applied. Uh, Brooklyn College, City College, Miami University in Ohio, and a few more. But then because my parents had newly, newly arrived here, I decided that I don't want to leave. So I stayed in New York, and I went to Brooklyn College, and I found that test to be very hard, the entrance test. But actually, I found that getting out of it even harder. But I made it. I made it. Uh, I majored in chemistry, and uh, I was active there. I founded the Chemistry Society News and the French group, and it was just good learning. I drew at school. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a period of time when you were, you were drafted, is that right? As soon as I was, uh, as I graduated, I received a draft notice. I said, uh, this is the Korean, Korean War. Uncle Sam wants you. Well, I thought he, he already had me. Because I found out later on that I was a ward of the state, and I didn't even know that. At uh, one time I was also, oh, I didn't mention that after staying with the family for a few months that they couldn't take me, that couldn't afford me because they had lost everything during the Depression. And I became a foster child, and I went to foster home. So this is when he was in high school, earning I was honors, in high school. and is in a foster home. Then when my parents came here, I left a beautiful, nice, comfortable home in Brooklyn to go to the slums of East New York. Anybody heard of Delancey Street? Not far from there. Well, we, we improved over the years. But uh, so uh, one, e one evening after graduation, I had a, we were having a farewell party for my going into the Army. When I received a phone call that same evening, if I can get a job as a chemist, I can be deferred from the Army. Well, I thought it was a joke, so the following day I called the draft board and that verified that indeed if I could get a job, I would be deferred, so I did. My first professional job as a chemist, $40 a week in Newark, New Jersey, took me over a half my salary to get there from Brooklyn, but I worked as a chemist, my first clinical job. I had a lot of different jobs until then, like selling hot dogs and other things, delivery boy. And uh, I didn't like some of the things that was going on in that chemical pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical company, so I, I got another job somewhere else in the Bronx. Then I decided that because I didn't care for what I was doing, checking on products, on the pharmaceutical products, that because I could speak Russian, even though I could not read nor write, I would be a better, better help to the government during the Cold War. So I decided to enlist into the Army. And again, I said goodbye to the family. A part of the family was here already. And I went, I reported to Fort Dix, uh, swore in, and 16 weeks of basic training, learning every weapon there was to be, to learn in, in the infantry. 
I became an infantryman. Fifteen weeks, I became a killer. And but uh, I applied for language school because I wanted to help with the Russian. So I waited for my orders. Everybody got their orders, and everybody went to Korea except me. I still waited for my orders. I finally got them. I said, "You can't. That, we can't send you to language school to learn Russian." You're a chemist. You're also already classified as a French and Spanish interpreter. Forget it. The first ship that went out went to Europe, so that's where I went. I ended up in Freiburg in Germany. I go to my CEO and say, get me the hell out of Germany. I'm not going to stay here because I just escaped from here. Something's going to happen. So they sent me to France, across the border. Well, I was home there. That was my language. I became a chemical supply specialist. What does that do? Well, we have gas masks over there. You just move them over there. <laughs> Smoke grenades from there to there. That's finished. Reverse the process. So I did that for a while until I got emergency leave. My father had been taken ill. And I came home for 30 days. By the time I got here, he had died. So after 30 days helping my mother set up, uh, I went back to, to France, to the camp, and came back as a chemical supply specialist until they needed a medic in Verdun, just a few miles away. About 40 miles away, they need a medic in that hospital, and I applied for the job. After all, chemistry is basically pharmacy, which is basically hospital, if you can relate, you know. So I became a medic, learning on a job training. But I had to give shots, and the army shots were great. Used big, thick needles with penicillin. You can cure the whole world. And that's what happened. And after two years, I decided to become a civilian again, in spite of their offer to make me an officer. I didn't want to be an officer. I just wanted to get out. I served my time. I served, I think I did my duty. The Korean War was practically over. I got my mustering out pay. And I vegetated in New York for two months, deciding what I wanted to do. I applied for a job at Brookhaven National Laboratory and started working as a radio chemist at Brookhaven with an Atomic Energy Commission. And I worked there for a few months until I decided I wanted to go on learning, so I wanted to get back to school. So I went back to New York, went to live with my mother, and got my, my master's. And uh, I had a friend of mine who was teaching math there that I had known from, from the school before. We used to play chess together, and he was a math major. He, he just got his PhD, and he was teaching in Brooklyn, and he offered to introduce me to a nice young lady because I offered to take him home because I, had, I was studying at night, and he was teaching at night. I was working during the day. And I had my car, and he didn't have his, so I offered to take him home. And he offered to stop at a young lady to introduce me, so we stopped there about 10, 10 o'clock evening. We met. She had stale coffee that she had made in the morning because she was also going to school. I called the next day, made a date, and six weeks later we were married. <laughs> Three dates, six weeks. And we had to wait for a brother to come to the, from the West Coast to be able to go to the wedding. That's why we waited so long. <laughs> <laughs> so today, I can say I had a wife, and I had, we had two kids and three grandchildren and four grand dogs. <laughs> uh, from Brookhaven, from after my master's, I was offered a fellowship in Florida, Florida State University. 
I went down to Tallahassee, was able to withstand it for a year, and then came back north and got a job at, in Delaware for about five years. And I was doing some research, but because I could not publish, because industry does not like to publish, they are afraid they may reveal too much. So I applied for government because I still remember the first job where I thought the boss was unethical with certain things. And I said, if I ever get to work with the government, I'm going to stop these people. So I finally got a job with the Food and Drug Administration, and I was involved with approving of new antibiotics. And I became an expert in the analysis, in the chemical analysis of antibiotics. And that was a challenge because before that, it used to be biological. And I converted that from biological to chemical. So what else? Uh, I was appointed. I was elected by the uh, Board of Supervisors of Fairfax County uh, for the uh, Human Rights Commission, mm -hmm. from which I just recently retired because, uh, as we started to mention before, when my father, well, I should say that my parents came to this country in May 1946. To the day, six years after the war started in Belgium, my sister married the Frenchman, not the guy that she followed to Palestine, but the guy she met on the, on the train in Spain that went to the ship. And he escaped. He served in the French underground, and he went to Spain, went to Palestine, enlisted in Jewish brigade to fight with the British army. And he went back to fight in Holland and Italy. And she had an uh, army wedding in uh, Israel. After returning to Israel, he joined the Haganah. But again, because of the food shortage in, Palestine, in Israel, that came here that we, we convinced him to come to America. My brother was in the kibbutz, and he came here three years later. So. It took us 13 years to get back together, but we all made it back. Uh, when my father died, well, while we were all separated, my father was in Portugal, my mother was in Spain, my siblings were in uh, Israel, and I was here. My father saved all the mail that we, we wrote to him. And when he died, my mother inherited that. When she died, my sister inherited that. And then when my sister died, her son got it. And I finally found out about it when he came to my grandson's bar mitzvah last year. And now I'm reading over 400 letters in French about what my sister and brother were thinking and writing about. And most of the complaints were about lack of food, lack of money, lack of facilities, lack of everything. I'm still reading it, but that was the main reason why I had to give up the Human Rights Commission. I'm still reading it. One of the interesting themes that Michel has talked to me about is um, he can tell from the letters that his father would be writing, asking uh, sort of like, what's the delay? Are you trying to come? Are you trying to get papers? And uh, his brother and sister would be writing to his father and saying, can you, can you talk to our uncle in America? Can you talk to the British consulate? Can you, everyone is, is writing back and forth trying to figure out why can they not make more progress to get out? Well, because of my father's training, he had, uh his teacher back in uh, Russia was a famous poet uh, by the name of uh, Bialik. And there's a museum in Tel Aviv called the Bialik Museum. And as a result, he, he was a very learned man. He could speak seven different languages. I spoke to him. By the time he came here, I was able to speak to him in French and in English. I didn't know any Portuguese. Michelle, I think we might have a few minutes for questions, if this is a yeah. good time for you. Sure. 
Great. So uh, people will be coming through the audience with microphones. If you can just uh, wait until you have a microphone to ask your question, that would be great. Is he going hand over there? Yeah, someone coming here. Hi, yes. Um, of course, back then there were no cell phones. So were these letters the only way that, because your family was spread out at times so far away, were let, writing letters really the only way of communication for you? Okay. She's asking uh, if letters were the only way that you were able to communicate. Oh no, we wrote to each other all the time. But we never expressed, we never talked about our experience. I said, I was, my father used to write to, especially when he wrote to the foster home, he, mm -hmm. he was telling them how wonderful I was doing in school. I, I was a marvelous student. I didn't tell them that. He, that's what he thought, but he, we communicated. We were always in communication, even though a lot of scribblings were blacked out because of the census. another question? Hi, thank you very much for telling us your story. I really appreciate it. It's very moving. Um, I have many questions, but I'll try to, can I just narrow it to two? Um, one is, did you ever find out what happened to Cafe Olay? Did you ever get connected to him again? I took the family to Europe on our 15th anniversary, and uh, we stopped in Marseille. I took my wife to Marseille, trying to show her the slums that she didn't want to see because she was afraid. She thought she saw somebody with a knife in his mouth, you know, like a pirate or whatever. But I went to the authorities trying to find out, and I couldn't find anything about him. I also got in touch with the uh, German archives in Bart Arlson that we all, we all work with, the greatest archives that ever existed in Germany, trying to find out about a farmer who took us in and my friend Raphael. And their names are even not in there, which means to me that they were safe. Had that been picked up, that would have been listed there. So I feel comfortable that they were all right. And just one other question. Um, I, I'm just overwhelmed with the international quality of your family and how the, so many places they live. Is that me? Um, I didn't quite get that. She's, uh, she, yeah, she's, she's mentioning the international quality of your family, but the microphone seems to be doing something. Okay. I just wondered why your mother had a Persian passport. How did that happen? When my father escaped from Siberia, he found refuge in Persia. And he had a colleague over there who helped him to become a Persian citizen. So we were all Persians at the time. So when I became a citizen myself, I had to relinquish that citizenship, which I didn't mind at all because I never knew anything about it. I found out through the history books that there was such an empire that was great back then. Today it's called Iran. We're not too friendly with them. <laughs> but that's the history of the world. We make friends, we lose friends, we make enemies, lots of them. Is there another question? Yes, I just have a question. If um, the concentration camp your brother went to in Spain, was that similar to the one that are in Germany, that were in Germany? Uh, could you repeat the question again? The concentration camp his brother oh. was in, was that comparable to the ones that were in Germany, or was it t different? Yeah. So she's asking about the concentration camp where your brother was held and whether this experience was at all similar to what we know of German camps. Well, the German camps, the most of the, I think every extermination camp that Germany had was in Poland. 
and most of the other camps were not extermination camp as such. The camp in Spain was mainly as a result of the civil war that I had in Spain, and originally they were for the Spanish prisoners. Is that adequate? Thank you. Do we have any more questions? That means you know everything? <laughs> Uh, if the folks with the mics can tell that there are, is, is there one? There's somebody over there. Oh, okay. Thank you. I've got another one. Um, you have been through an incredible experiences. Your family has managed to survive all kinds of terrible things. What do you think that keeps you with such a good sense of humor and um, so open to the world? Well, I like to claim that I have two techniques to keep me well. One is music, which I learned in, in, uh, through that uh, opera that I learned at my friend's house, and the music uh, and humor. When I was running the Parkinson's support group here with my wife at Parkinson's, I was appointed the humor editor of the bulletin. <laughs> and without humor, it's difficult to live, especially in this world. We need it. So I have a list in French and Spanish. I also have an adult one, but I don't talk about it. <laughs> uh, and I still keep it up. And you email this list, right? You email jokes I out? I email jokes every day to, uh, to a list that I have. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> She'd like I, to get on your list. <laughs> I send Irish jokes to my congressman. <laughs> my congressman is a great guy, Jerry Conley in uh, Virginia, and we became good friends. So I don't send to his office, I send to his home, to his wife. But he reads, he reads it more, mm -hmm. and he keeps insisting, please send me Irish jokes. And he's willing to use those that are acceptable. <laughs> uh, Michelle, I've, I've asked you a number of times about experiences that you had that sound incredibly frightening to me, like machine gunning the train that you were in and, and actually seeing people injured and, and die. And have asked about your response to that, and I'm always surprised by the way you, you answer about whether you were scared in these moments. I guess I was scared. Uh, I remember in basic training, uh, something called infiltration course, where we were supposed to crawl on the machine gun firing. And one of the kids got up and got shot. And that was not far from me, so experience, but learn to live with it. Keep on going. My wife had Parkinson. I took care of her for 12 years. Cooked and took care of her. Mm -hmm. So we do what we can with what we have, and we have to make the best of it, especially today. So our uh, tradition at First Person is to have our first person close the program. I'd like to thank you all very much for being here. We hope that you'll come back. Uh, we have our first person program every Wednesday and Thursday until the middle of August. And uh, Michelle here will have uh, the last word. Before we turn back to him, I'd like to let you know that at the end of our program, um, we like to ask uh, our, our photographer, Joel, will come to the stage and will take a portrait. So if you can all remain in your seat, uh, Michelle will be up here and Joel will shoot it from this direction. Uh, so with that, Michelle, do you mind uh, giving us your closing remarks? Just a few words that I have written, because I I cannot rely on my memory anymore. I'm only, uh, I'm approaching 100 years of age, slowly. <laughs> we know the Holocaust as a time when the spark of evil flared into a raging fire that engulfed much of Europe. I was alone when I came to America in June 1943 just a couple of weeks before the invasion of Sicily. 
It was also around the time that a, ra that a race riot blazed in Harlem and Jews and other minorities were not accepted everywhere in this country. Yes, America has grown a bit, but the consuming, consuming embers of discrimination, bigotry, and intolerance have never been extinguished. New voices of ignorance, economic greed, political and religious zealots have researched and are spreading those old fears that are splitting the world asunder and perpetuating genocidal racial and ethnic conflicts. Progress means that we must embrace our expanding diversity and support education more fully at all levels and get to know our neighbors better for America and the world to become a better and more secure place for our children and grandchildren to live happily, grow and prosper. Once more, I'm reaffirming my own legacy with memories from those dreadful days, as well as those happily derived afterwards. Uh, as I am bearing witness to the Holocaust, I leave it to this great museum and to you, all of you, to ensure that they will be remembered. Hate and genocides must be banished from this earth to survive. This nation became a world leader primarily because of its moral values and innovative science and technology that you can embrace without fear. Learn about your country and the issues troubling it. If you want democracy to thrive, know your rights and use them judiciously and more importantly, vote. But of course, vote for the right people. Thank <laughs> you.